without further ado, I'll turn it over um, to Elder uh, Dane Stewart. And time is yours. God bless. Thank you, Jose. Jose and Jennifer, are just their family's just been a blessing to uh, be here at Little Creek, and uh, I just appreciate that entire family there. Yeah. Well, good morning. Happy Sabbath. Today we're going to uh, be looking at uh, something that I've titled, you know, is, well, let me back up just a second. It's always interesting to me to try to come up with a title of, of a sermon, and uh, sometimes I change the title two or three times before it, uh, before Sabbath, and today was one of those times, and so, uh, but I wound up with the Jubilee prophecy, and so I hope that you will be blessed today as we uh, study this, this subject. I have an introduction picture here, I think. Does anyone recognize this picture? The Liberty Bell. It's fairly famous in the United States, isn't it? On July the 4th, 1776, the Continental Congress voted on the Declaration of Independence. They, of course, did not have television, internet, radio, or any type of fast communication. And so several days later, remember, they signed it on July the 4th, 1776. Four days later, on July the 8th, the reading of the Declaration of, uh, of the Independence occurred throughout the, the uh, states at that time. And, of course, pictured here was the picture of the Liberty Bell, one of the bells that rang on July the 8th, four days later. You know, it takes... They didn't have, again, very fast communication. And so the bells rang throughout the land and the Declaration of Independence was read on July the 8th. Now, one of the things that, uh, well, let me ask you, how many of you, and if you have extra eagle eyesight, can you read the, the lettering on the top of the bell there? It sort of blends in, doesn't it? But we have, uh, uh, here is what is written on the bell. It says, proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. And then it says, Leviticus 25, verse 10. That's really neat, isn't it? That. Our forefathers, and of course these were in uh, Philadelphia, and our forefathers ordered this bell. It was cast in England and brought to the United States, and, uh, and this was inscribed. The bell cracked the first time it was used. You know, that is sad. And so the names of, uh, of the two individuals there, Pass and Stowe, they were... Uh, sort of metal workers, they recast the, the, uh, the bell two different times, and it's still cracked. Uh, and so uh, anyway, they've analyzed the metal and decided that, you know, it had some inferior metal uh, within the bell causing the crack. But our subject today has a lot to do about liberty and freedom. And so we're going to be studying the book of Leviticus. Leviticus is not one of the go-to books as far as casual reading or anything like that. Um, and, but we're going to be studying because there are some precious promises in the book of Leviticus. The name of the book of Le Leviticus means of the Levites. This book has uh, quite a few of commands from God to the Israelite nation that have prophetic importance, not to just them, but to also to us. Now, as Seventh-day Adventists, we are very conscious of the Seventh-day Sabbath. We stand out as a small segment of Christianity that firmly believe that no man had the authority to change a commandment of God, including the Fourth Commandment, which was written by the finger of God 
own no less than stone. We recognize that the Sabbath goes all the way back to creation and it was actually the crowning act of God's creation, a day, a day of rest from work. And we also recognize from God's word that it was not only a day of rest, but it was a day of worship, just like we're doing today. A worship for, to our creator, a day that God sanctified, a day that God made holy, as only God can make that determination. And so today we're going to make a deeper dive into God's word and we'll look at other Sabbaths that God commanded the Israelites to follow. I say Israelites because these Sabbaths differed from the Seventh day Sabbath in that they were, com were not commanded at creation, but they were established when God led the Israelite Israelites out of Egypt and they were not even then designated to start until the Israelites entered into the Promised Land. And these other Sabbaths were to start at that point in time. And so we're going to uh, be, be studying about these Sabbaths, which stand out very prominently in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus is a very interesting book. And these additional Sabbaths we're going to uh, be looking at today, it's, uh, the, the book actually starts out by God telling Moses about not a one-day, 24-hour Sabbath, but a Sabbath that lasts an entire year. Is that sort of blow your mind a little bit? A Sabbath that lasts an entire year. But this Sabbath was a little bit different. It wasn't so much for you and I, it was actually a Sabbath for the land. As the creator of the world, God declared that the land was his. We are as well, but in this case, the year-long Sabbath was for the land. Leviticus 25, 23. The land shall not be so permanently, for the land is whose? Mine, you are only foreigners and temporary residents with me. Leviticus 25 goes further. Verse 1, it says, The Lord said to Moses on Mount Sinai, Say to the Israelites, When you come into the land of Canaan, which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years you shall sow your field, and for six years you shall prune your vineyard, and gather in its fruits. But in the seventh year, there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. What grows of itself in your harvest you shall not reap, and the grapes on your uncultivated vine you shall not gather, for it is a year of rest to the land." And the Sabbath rest of the untilled land shall in its increase furnish food for you. That is what we would call uh, volunteers. I know when I have my garden and I go out there to plant and in the early spring, sometimes I'll see some little plants come up that's not grass and it's not weeds. And so I have to figure out what I planted there last year because I have what we call volunteers that come up. And sometimes... That's my whole crop for that particular item. I'll take it and transplant it to different places. In this case, it was just volunteers that the people gathered up, or the fruit of. So, um, let me get back to my place here. Verse 6, And the Sabbath rest of the untilled land shall in its increase furnish food for you, for your male and female slaves, your hired servant, and the temporary resident who lives with you. Now, I mentioned a while ago that the Sabbath rest of the land, this one-year period, the seventh year, was not to start until the Israelites actually entered the Promised Land. Six years the land was to be worked, but the seventh year was a Sabbath. The land was to rest and not be worked. And this was an, an acknowledgment that everything belonged to the Lord. The Israelites, just like you and I, are only stewards of everything that we have. 
The Israelites lived off the land, and so God answered a question on their minds even before they could ask it. it this, we find this in Leviticus 25. And you can imagine when God first told them, and Moses relayed the message, that they were not to plant or even till or harvest the, the fruits. You could go out there and walk around and get something, but you were not to have a full-fledged harvest or anything like that. And so you can imagine the first question that came to their mind about a year, they, these were all farmers, <laughs> or you know, they tended sheep and things like that. And so their livelihood, God had just put a, a uh, wedge in, into their, uh, their plan. Can you imagine being a farmer and, and God telling you, you don't farm the Sabbath year? And so the first question that came into their, their mind, God anticipated. Leviticus 25, verse 20. And it says that if you say, what are we going to eat in the Sabbath year if we do not sow seed or gather in our crops? Legitimate question. And God already has an answer to legitimate questions. It says, then this is my answer. This is God speaking. I will order my special blessing for you in the sixth year so that it will produce sufficient crops for three years. Now, is that called a bumper crop or not? Three years. God is telling you up front. People didn't have to ask for it. God had a plan. God anticipates our needs before we ask. It says, continue here, verse 22. It says, when you're sowing the eighth year, you can still eat old things from the crops, that is the former crop, eating the old until the ninth year when its crops come in. Wow. God promises to bless the Israelites with a triple crop harvest in year six to tide them over this annual Sabbath for the land. It reminds me a little bit about the manna when they went into the wilderness, doesn't it? On Friday, they got a double portion, didn't they? And God provided for, for that double portion. They didn't have to go out and, and fast or do without on the Sabbath day, did they? The Lord provides. The Lord always provides. Of course, the Israelites, many of them, did not believe God and failed to obey this command. And as a result, they were later taken into captivity. And the land enjoyed its Sabbaths without their occupation. Unfortunately, a lot of people tend to be disobedient and not trust in God's word. Another thing that we find in Leviticus is dealing with something we've studied this quarter in our Sabbath school lesson, debts. In Deuteronomy 15, we read that all debts were released as well at the end of a seven-year cycle. How would you like to live in that economy? End of six years, seventh year, your mortgage is paid off, all the car payments have gone, credit cards gone, loans gone, debt is extinguished. Y'all in favor of that? Yeah. yeah, that'd be pretty pretty neat. Let's look at Deuteronomy 15. It says, At the end of every seven years you shall grant a release, and this is the manner of the release. Every creditor shall release that which he has lent to his neighbor. He shall not exact it of his neighbor. That is, he's not go there and shake him and say, you know, you pay up. You know. um, he shall not exact it of his neighbor, his brother, did you just see what I, or listen to what I said? His neighbor was considered what? His brother. And we are just like we were brothers. And the people over here that you don't even know their name, they are your brothers. People across the street, the people in the grocery store, people we work with, we're all brothers and sisters. It says, uh, for the Lord's release is proclaimed. And then we have something that goes back to our title of our sermon, the Jubilee. How many of you have heard the word Jubilee before, haven't you? Is it a happy or sad time? Happy. It's a happy time. And we have songs, you know, written about the Jubilee and things of like that nature. We're going to state a little bit more about the Jubilee. We find in the book of Leviticus this new word called Jubilee, and it occurs in the Bible, 25 times. 
And you don't have to go very far to find 23 of them. 23 times in the book of Leviticus, the word Jubilee is mentioned. And then you have two other occurrences in the whole rest of the Bible. Hmm, interesting. But if you want to learn about the Bible Jubilee, if you read the book of Leviticus, you're going to read 23 of those 25 times, just like that. And you will know more about it. But we're going to read uh, most of these today, or a good number of them. Leviticus 25, verse 8. It says, and God says, And you shall number seven Sabbaths, or weeks, of years for you, seven times seven years. That is, it's clear. What, seven times seven? Forty-nine. So the t total time of the seven weeks of year shall be forty-nine years. Now, being a CPA uh, during my career, I like numbers. I mean, numbers just, and I imagine Jose's like that, and other, other people that, and uh, Monica, she's an accountant. Uh, you know, accountants deal with, with numbers a lot, and, you know, they just are meaningful. They're boring for most people, but, <laughs> but, but accountants can have a little bit of life. And so I like numbers, and it, there's no doubt in my mind that God is partially to accountants. He does a lot of things with numbers in the Bible. If you read the Bible and you can't tell that God has some special numbers, you're dreaming or something. God loves numbers. And seven is certainly a very, very special number to God. And it signifies completion. And in this case, we don't have just seven. We have seven times seven, which magnifies the completion aspect even more than just one seven. And so in verse 9, we're going to see something unusual. It says, Then you shall sound abroad the loud trumpet on the tenth day of the, what? Seventh month. This would normally be, what, the month of October for us. On the day of atonement, blow the trumpet in all your land. Let's keep reading here, verse 10. And you shall hallow or keep holy the 50th year. You know, we just talked about 7 times 7, 49 years. We're up to year 50. The 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. Now, if your memory cell is still active, what was written on the liberty bell? This portion of this verse right here that we just read is written on the liberty bell. God goes on to say, it shall be, this is year 50, it shall be a jubilee for you, and, and each of you shall return to his ancestral possession, which through poverty he was compelled to sell. That is, if you lost your land, your house was foreclosed on, you had to sell it to pay medical expenses, whatever the case may be, you were to go back to that property. Let's continue to read here. Um, it shall be a jubilee for you, and it, each of you shall return to his ancestral possession, which through property he was compelled to sell. And each of you shall return to his family from whom he was separated in bond service. That is, back in those days, you could basically become a slave yourself. Uh, you could sell your services for a period of time. And you could go to work. You were a hired hand. And so we're going to, to see here more about this. In verse 11 here, it says, That 50th year shall be a what, jubilee for you. In it you shall not sow or reap and store what grows of itself, or gather the grapes of the uncultivated vines, for it is a jubilee. It shall be holy to you, you shall eat the sufficient increase of it out of the field. And so again, you could go out and, and walk through the fields and eat, but you were not to go out there and do all the threshing and harvesting and all that. Now just remember, year 49, you had the same thing happen. That was one of the seven years, 7, 14, 21, 28. All those were Sabbath years. And year 49 was a Sabbath year. And here is God saying, year 50, you're going to do the same thing. You're not going to sow, you're not going to reap. So, 
but God had always promised to provide. And so we, we have here something that is even bigger. We have the seven years, then we have 49 years or seven times seven, and then we have this 50th year. It was God's year, a year of jubilee to be kept holy for God's purposes. And so we have, again, these back-to-back -back Sabbaths of years, year 49 and year 50. How would you like to be a farmer? God tells you you, you, you can't plant, sow, or reap uh, for two years. But God always provided, didn't he? And so the start of the Jubilee year, we're going to have to look at this for a moment. It began at the close of the Day of Atonement, which occurred on the 10th day of the seventh month of the Jewish year. And again, that would be the year uh, in the year October for us. When we speak about the Day of Atonement, it was the most holy, solemn time of the year. It was a year signifying the confession of our sins of the entire nation, not just the individuals, the entire nation of Israel, and the sacrificial or atoning sacrifice of Jesus, the Lamb who took away the sins. This 50th year of the Jubilee was to be ushered in by the blowing of the trumpets, signifying the restoration of the property. I wish I had one of these big horns that we could blow. That would be of real effect, but that's what happened back then. It also meant that all debts were released, and it meant freedom for those who had sold themselves as slaves. Leviticus 25.10 says, Consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all of its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you is to return to your family property and to your own clan. When we study God's word, we need to understand that this is just not a history lesson. It is a history lesson, but it means something to us living today just as it meant something to the people living in that day. And so we should always ask ourselves, what does this mean? How does this apply to me and you? It was a test. The seventh day Sabbath, the seventh annual Sabbath year, and the Jubilee Sabbath were all tests for God's people as to whether they would believe and trust and obey God. You remember the story about how when the Israelites came into the wilderness, God gave them manna. Remember that story? Well-known story. He said, you're supposed to go out and gather it how many days a week? Six days. But not the seventh day. And on the sixth day, you would gather twice as much. And what would happen the, all the other days of the week if you gathered too much? It, it rot overnight. Except God provided a miracle on, on what we would say Friday night preceding the Sabbath. That manna did not rot at all. And it carried over onto the uh, Sabbath. I mean, it carried it through for the Sabbath day. But we find that some people went out on Sabbath morning to look for manna. You remember that? We'll come back to that. Let's look at Leviticus 26, 43, about how people responded to God's test. The Sabbath, the annual Sabbath, the seventh annual Sabbath, and the Jubilee Sabbath. Leviticus 26, 43, But the land shall be left behind them and shall enjoy its Sabbath while it lies desolate without them. That is, they had been taken into captivity because they had refused to obey God. And it says, And they shall accept the punishment for their sins and make amends because they despised and rejected my ordinances, and their souls scorned and rejected my statutes. Jeremiah 25, 11 continues, and this whole land shall be a waste and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And so they paid the price of disobedience. In Exodus 16, 27, 
we were talking about the manna not falling on the Sabbath day, but a double portion fell on Friday, the sixth day. Exodus 16, 27 addresses this. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather. Now, was this in accordance with God's will or direction? Absolutely not. It says, but they found none. That is, there was manna there six days a week. The seventh day, there was none. It said, but they went out trying to find it. And the Lord said to Moses, how long do you people refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Deuteronomy 8, 16 it says, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end? Jeremiah 17, 21 continues to this. Thus says the Lord, take heed to yourselves, and for the sake of your lives, bear no burden on the Sabbath day, or bring it through the gates of Jerusalem. That is, don't, don't be working. And do not carry a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day or do any work, but keep the Sabbath day holy, set apart for the worship of God as I have commanded your fathers. Yet, this is a test, yet they would not listen and obey or incline their ears, but they stiffened their necks that they might not hear and might not receive instruction. Now, we just said a few minutes ago, one of the important things for us to do is apply these things to who? Me and you. We do not want to be stiff-necked. We do not want to have our ears closed up and our eyes closed. We want to listen to God and we want to obey. And so the Jubilee taught godly principles how we are to uh, treat our fellow man and also about how God was going to one day restore his people in the promised land of heaven he was going to and it is going to forgive their debts their sins they would no longer be slaves to sin the earth will have its sabbath of the millennium all will be restored to god's original plan and look for let me just back up here for a second it's always really neat when i prepare a sermon and then I see uh, something related that I had no control over tie right in. And in our lesson quarterly for today, this tied into it. And I said, wow, you know, God's working on me as far as the subject matter of sermon. And he's worked several years ago on whoever wrote the quarterly for it to be the same subject or some some of the same verses Luke 4 says so he that is Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah and when he had opened the book he found the place where it was written verse 18 the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He's talking about the Jubilee here. And we see that it's to set at liberty those who are oppressed and proclaim liberty to the captives. And so Jesus is teaching this from the book of Isaiah, but Isaiah is taking this from a thousand years earlier, God's commands at Mount Sinai to the Israelites. And he's talking about the Jubilee. It's wonderful how the Bible ties together. We have Leviticus, and then we have Isaiah, and then we have, have Jesus uh, fulfilling this, these prophecies. It's wonderful. But Jesus clearly taught that this passage that he read from, from the the uh, book of Isaiah was being fulfilled by his ministry that would culminate in the forgiveness of debts. And uh, we were thinking about when we were talking earlier about forgiving, you remember the, our mortgage, car payments, notes at the bank, money that you borrowed. Jesus is forgiving something completely different from that, isn't he? Our debts with Jesus are different. Our debts with Jesus are our sins 
And that is what Jesus is forgiving. He's wiping that slate clean. Forgiveness of our sins brings true freedom and restoration. And so in conclusion, it's very apparent that God's commands in Leviticus were much more than just arbitrary rules or guidelines for the Israelites. They were, in fact, prophecies. God ordained that these events point forward to the prophetic great day of the great day of atonement when it will be complete. The trumpet will be blasted. It will be heard throughout the entire earth. You know, back in the days of Israel, the trumpet sound might have gone for maybe a mile or two like this. The trumpet blast when Jesus comes back will be heard around the world. It's hard for us to comprehend. The Jubilee points forward to the second coming of Jesus in the millennium when the earth will have a thousand years Sabbath. That is, the earth will be desolate for a thousand years. It's pointing forward to that. And so when we read and study the Old Testament, we need to look at all these lessons that God has that are prophetic in nature and point us to God's plan of salvation. The seventh day Sabbath, the seventh annual Sabbath, the Jubilee, the year 50, all taught us about aspects of the plan of salvation, just as the sacrificial system did. All of these institutions were designed to teach man his rightful place as a part of God's creation and his redemption, and as a steward of resources that we've been entrusted with. And so the stories and experiences of people in the Bible have a deeper significance than when we often realize. And, you know, we could take each story, we could take the story about David and Goliath. You know, David was a little young guy here, small in statue. We have Goliath over here. You know who he represented. It was not the good guys. And so we, we have all these stories. David was a champion for his people. How many fought the battle between David and Goliath? It's just David. He represented Jesus, didn't he? And Goliath represented Lucifer. But we have David prevailing through the power of God against Goliath. And so all these lessons have wonderful uh, uh, object lessons for us. God wants us to be obedient. He wants to, us to follow him with all of our hearts and our minds. He wants us to love him with all our being, just as he loved us beyond our comprehension. He wants us to be free from pain and misery of sin in this world. He wants us to witness and proclaim liberty from sin through Jesus. Ring the bell. That's what the liberty bell was for, wasn't it? Ring the bell of freedom. Let the whole world know about God's love and his redemption that comes through Jesus' shed blood. And so the issue for us is for us to be different than the Israelites. They were disobedient. They went into captivity. We need to be obedient and trust God, even when we can't see the way. Maybe we can't see the way for a triple crop, a bumper crop. Well, I hadn't, I've been planting here five years, and I hadn't had a bumper crop. I'm going to plant one more year, and, and I'm going to plant number seven, too. You know, that mentality. You've got to trust God. So let us be faithful. Let us be obedient. Let us trust God with all our hearts as we wait for the second coming. Let's fire our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the lessons that you've given us in the scriptures. We thank you for watching over us. We thank you for your long suffering. We thank you for your mercies. And we pray, dear Lord, that you will help our faith to grow strong, help us to always trust you with all our hearts and souls and minds. Help us to be faithful, dear Lord, in all that we do and say, and even think in our minds, help us to be faithful. We pray that, that you will guide and direct our, our paths and be with thy people here at Little Creek, but also throughout the world, dear Lord, because this is a worldwide um, plan of salvation that you've put in place for us. And we thank you, and we love you, dear Lord, 
and again helps us to be faithful and and be ready for your soon coming we pray in the name of jesus christ our lord and our savior and our redeemer amen jesus is coming again let's bow our head for prayer dear beloved heavenly father we thank you lord again for your mercy for your grace for your kindness for your love for your patience Forgive us for our sins again. God, transform and change our life. Thank you for the wonderful promises that you have made, the sacrifices. We were creative out of love. When you sustain us out of love, you transform us out of love. God, you made the sacrifice that you pay the price on the cross to forgive us for our sins. Thank you, Lord. Bless your children here today. Look at the sacrifice, the effort they have made to be here, looking, searching for you. Searching, searching and seeking for your word. Seeking for your peace. Seeking for your forgiveness. Thank you, O Lord. Let your Holy Spirit be with us, accompany us the rest of your Holy Sabbath. And we ask, as always, a double portion of your Holy Spirit upon each one of us. And we ask, we beg, we plead all of this in the name and the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. amen.